Yeah, so obviously we're sitting here in uh, Washington on a mm-hmm. nice, uh, beautiful, gloomy day. <laughs> yep. And uh, I just wanted to catch up with you and, and uh, kind of start off with just kind of how you ended up here and, and uh, what you think of Washington so far. Um, well, you know, Brandon is here, so I had to follow him. But um, when he got his job offer out here, because we were in Orlando, um, it was a little bit of a hard decision just because Orlando's my home and, you know, he decided to go out there. Yeah. So um, it was it was a hard decision, but um, ultimately it was a good decision and um, we decided to come out here. He came out here first. Um, it was about a month after because I had actually been offered a job in Orlando um, at the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided to work that for a little bit. Then I realized that I probably should be here with Brandon, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I started looking for jobs out here and I actually got offered a job at um, one of the children's hospitals. So that was another incentive to get my butt out here. So, yeah. so, so um, how'd that conversation go? Because, you know, kind of backstory, if I remember correctly, uh, obviously uh, you got, you know, some pretty deep family roots in, mm-hmm. in Florida. And um, I remember when Brandon, uh, went out to go live with you and, and, uh, how much, uh, you know, shit we gave him for, <laughs> for yeah. going and, and, uh, <laughs> when he got that opportunity to come back, I, I was like, dude, there's no way <laughs> Francesca is going to go for it. Yeah. How did that pitch go? Like, how did he convince you? <laughs> um, well, he didn't really convince me. Um, when he told me, it was just kind of like, Hey, I got a job offer at you know, your company and yeah. And I was like in Washington (laughs) (laughs) and he was like, yeah, it's like, okay. (laughs) And it kind of just ended there. I think for the day, cause it was already, you know, he just got home from work and we were kind of tired. So it's just kind of like, all right, we'll continue this (laughs) some other time. Yeah. Um, but when he was really telling me about the offer, I could see that he wanted to take it and really like he had already sacrificed a lot to come to Florida. So I felt like it was kind of my turn to, you know, put some things aside and, uh, make the move out here. Yeah. And it sounds like you're working out here already, right? Mm -hmm. So any, uh, fun, interesting stories from the first few days, anything that you're allowed to share any Um, crazy moments or. There's actually been a lot. There's a lot that is kind of hard to share just because, you know, there's just things that happen. But um, uh, I'd say it was funny. There was uh, a little girl. Um, she fell off her bike, which and it was on the road. And, you know, we all know road rash yeah. too well. Um, so I actually was able to kind of like clean her wounds and she was crying because it hurt. And I was just like, I'm sorry, like, but I can tell you that I know what you're going through. <laughs> like, I've been in this situation before. I've been at the hospital where they were trying to clean my wounds, and it wasn't a good time. But um, it was kind of cool because, you know, I told her like, I'm a speed skater, and I have um, the roller skate charm on my necklace, and it was hanging down. And she was like, oh, like, the, the charm on your necklace? I was like, yeah. And she was asking me about it. So it was, like, really cool to kind of, like, ease her pain yeah. through something that I've always loved. So So what's a like what's a typical day look like from you? Are you working full time right now? Um yeah, because I'm on orientation right now, so I'm just kind of training. Mm-hmm. So I'll be working full time through my orientation. After that, um I kind of have the luxury to choose my schedule just yeah. cuz I'm still in school. So mm-hmm. um it will really depend on, you know, the week and the patient load at the hospital cuz right now it's not very high. Yeah. Um but I'd say so the position I'm in, I'm an ER tech, which is pretty much like a glorified assistant in the ER. So we okay. can assist nurses when they're placing IVs, when they're giving medication. We help, you know, if there's a squirmy baby, mm-hmm. we help kind of hold them down so they can do what they need to do. Yeah. Um, we set up a lot of procedures for doctors. So like mm. if they need to stitch up a kid, oh geez. we get all the stuff for them so they can do that. And usually the cool part is, is we get to stay, stick around and... Um, like help calm the kid so you see everything yeah yeah oh god (laughs) oh yeah Yeah, that's gonna be hard right oh it's already been pretty hard yeah that's crazy i I don't know how i would uh 
I don't know how I would deal with that. That would be really tough to, it's a little bit easier. I feel like if you see an, a, an adult get mm-hmm. hurt, obviously you don't want to see anyone get hurt, but like a, a kid, holy smokes, that would be yeah, hard to see. Yeah, I feel like there's, it gets to a certain point with um, adults, you kind of lose your patience a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like with kids, it's, I feel a little bit more excited to, you know, help them because I know it, it's probably a little bit harder because it's such a, you know, a different environment for them. So mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm assuming that there's a lot of opportunity out here for your field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which yeah, is for sure. Awesome. Everywhere, really. Yeah. Now, with all the changes that you've been dealing with, with coming to a new place mm-hmm. and getting really started with your career, are you finding time to skate? Yeah, we've skated. We've skated a good amount. Yeah. Um, we've skated outside, thankfully. Yeah. And indoors too, a little bit. So. Um, yeah, I'm glad we've been able to skate. It's helped us. It's helped keep us sane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's um, let's kind of back up a little bit, and uh, you know, let's. I'm sure a lot of people watching right now um, want to hear us talk about skating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I, I haven't really gotten an opportunity to really hear much from your perspective um, on what the, you know the experience was like. You know, kind of coming into the NSC. You know, for mm-hmm. years we didn't have a girls' league and. Now I feel, gosh, what's it been five or six years we've had a girls league now yeah. and you're the most decorated, um, you know, woman speed skater inside the NSC. And, and uh, I would love to hear kind of that journey and, and uh, your perspective, especially on the, on the very first NSC, what was that like? And kind of really dive in more descriptively with, you know, what you were feeling at the time, mm-hmm. what your fears were, the insecurities, everything. I'd love yeah. to hear about it. Um, so I have to admit, I was a little mad at you guys for a very long time <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I was much younger and much more, I don't know, I had stronger opinions um, towards you guys because you didn't have a women's league. Yeah. I, it it kind of hurt my feelings a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even when you guys announced that you were going to do the women's league, I, I debated not going just <laughs> to kind of... <laughs> Say like, well, you guys should have done this earlier. Yeah. Um, but obviously I showed up and um, it was really a special time because, you know, I hadn't met you before, you know, mm. me and Brandon, obviously we weren't dating at the time. So I got to rekindle with Brandon. I've known him for a while. So um, and I got to see really what goes on with yep. NSC because I had watched, you know, a lot of times. So that was really cool to be a part of. And then once trials happened, you know, it was fun. It was awesome. I got to make the first NSC um, women's roster. And then NSC, the first NSC came around. And um, at that point I had just started racing people like Aaron Jackson. Yeah. So it was nerve wracking. Um, I think I had come back from um, my second worlds and I, ended up meddling there so I was really on a high Mm -hmm. and I think that helped me more than anything yeah um but back to the first NSC Brittany Bo also came into the um to the race so I think that that race in particular was one of the hardest yeah it was was pretty cool too because when with both uh Brittany and and Aaron Mm -hmm. um we obviously knew that there was two powerhouse women and Aaron doesn't really skate much indoors, right? Like I always knew how good Aaron is. Obviously Aaron's an incredible indoor skater, but she kind of took her career to a place where it was kind of not really challenging anymore. Yeah. And like, it's been like that for a while. Yeah, It's been like that for a while. And there really wasn't an environment for women's speed skating where all the best girls could race each other at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it really took away from the quality of racing. And so you had skaters like Aaron choosing not to compete at indoor nationals or, you know, for whatever reason. And then when we started the NSC, uh, I I can't remember how it happened, but I'm pretty sure Joe called me and said, Hey, I I think Brittany wants to skate. Mm -hmm. And at this time, Brittany is like, she's the one on ice yeah. and you're going, whoa, like, you know, and Brittany left in lines when she was a very dominant force. Yeah. Right. And so we talk about some of these generational eras and, uh, Brittany and Joey were kind of the last of that really like American dynasty. Right. Yeah, We've had some sure. obviously quality skaters that have come past that, but they were still really viewed at that, like kind of Columbia level mm-hmm. status. And so 
to get an opportunity to have someone like you who is up and coming and then race you know two of the skaters that are kind of bigger than the sport yeah um we were really curious how that was going to go down and so um you know everyone knows the results but you really rose to the challenge so yeah. um going into that last race that grand champions race which you know at the end of the day like the other races are awesome but like at the end yeah. of the day that's the bragging rights race yeah, right for like sure what was going through your head? What was the mentality? Like, were you going for the win? Were you nervous to race those girls? Were you just happy to be there? Like, what what were you thinking going into that? I feel like I've always had a special mentality. Like, I've never, I can tell you this wholeheartedly, I've never gone on the line and said, yes, I'm gonna win. Like, uh, that's never been my personality. Mm -hmm. um, I would go to up, up to the line and say, you know, I'm gonna do everything that I can do in my power and whatever happens, happens. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like, speed skating doesn't define you you yeah. know so um going into that race again aaron Brittany were all on the line i was freaking out I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was freaking out i can't lie um but i just i've always told myself that i'm gonna do everything that i can and whatever happens happens and that race in particular a lot of crazy things happened yeah. and <laughs> um yeah it was it was pretty scary going in, so I can't lie. And we had to set the precedence. It was yeah. the first NSC women's grand champion race. Yeah. Like we had to make it great. So there's also that pressure too. I was so optimistic about the race that uh, I put you guys as the main event, the first, mm -hmm. the very first NSC. I because don't I remember that. Yeah, you guys were the last race because um, I just, I don't know, I just knew uh, that yeah. that race is going to be incredible. And, mm -hmm. and also anytime it's the first, like everybody wants to be the, the first of so that added level of, uh, intensity. Yeah. And then that floor was so dang challenging in the early years. I mean, it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was a hard floor to skate on a really hard floor to skate on in those early years. Um, now I feel like that floor is pretty awesome, but yeah. it took some dang time to get all the coding down and really get to the, and our wheel technology wasn't there either. So we had, yeah so many challenges going into that so um but no i uh, i remember just being so juiced up about that and you know when we first uh introduced the women's league it, there was some damage control that needed to happen because mm -hmm. um we're talking to a bunch of athletes that don't really understand the reason why we made that decision and really this the most simple answer was that it was just complete financial like we got to pay for it yeah and we're, we don't want to pay you less right and so it was kind of this uh, you know, tiptoe into it is like, all right, let's see if we can get the guys going. All right, let's try to make some more money. All right, obviously we got to bring the girls along. And yeah. then we needed the women's field too because there was a long period of time where in the United States, the women's field just, they just weren't skating. Yeah. Right. And so the timing was perfect um, for that first event and it was incredible. And yeah, it was great. So um, after the race, uh, you know, you and Brittany had a pretty epic battle, took it all the way to the line, mm -hmm. and uh, she barely inched you out. Um, were you happy after the race? Were you mad you didn't win? Like, what was your kind of take on it? I felt like I wasn't mad because realistically, look who beat me. <laughs> like, yeah. how could I really be mad? But it also fired me up. It's like, well, going into this race, I didn't really think I could race with these women, mm -hmm. but I can. Yeah. So I think that was a really good, I guess, catalyst for the next couple races, the next couple seasons, the next NSCs. So. Yeah. When, um, when you've been at your peak for skating, like where you're, you know, at the highest level of confidence, you're your mm -hmm. fastest, um, can anyone beat you? No, because <laughs> there were lots of times where nobody did. So. Yeah. That's the only reason I say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I love listening to athletes and um, really hearing their mentality, right? And when mm -hmm. we, when we kind of look at athletes from every sport, whether that's skating or basketball or whatever, you, you get sometimes these athletes that are very much so, um, very much so mentally strong mm -hmm. that the athleticism seems to be second to that. And then there's, athletes that are really incredible where the athleticism is the the prime example and yeah um i always love the uh jordan and lebron debate right yeah and 
I also think that there's this big aspect of nostalgia that happens where whatever era you grew up in um, determines like who you think the best is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm, I'll bring this full circle here, which is, um, you know, in skating, it's always been, is Mantia or is Chad, Chad the best male ever? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and, and why. <sighs> It's just so hard because I grew up, like you said, I grew up watching Joey. He was literally like, I was watching him like from this distance. Yeah. Because when I started with Team Florida, he was still skating with Team Florida. So I saw how incredible, like he really was in person. So I was never able to experience the Chad era because yeah. I'm not old enough, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, when it comes down to accolades, I understand that there are people who have more accolades or better accolades, but um, like you said, I think it all boils down to the time as well, because you don't know what skaters from Colombia, from France, from Netherlands were there during the Chad era. You don't know which skaters were there during Joey era, so it's kind of, it's really hard to compare because yeah. you just, you can't. Yeah, so. that's why the conversation's so fun. It's impossible to determine, right? Like, like boxing, like you can't determine Muhammad Ali is it Tyson, who's ever, mm -hmm. and that I think that's what makes the conversation so fun because people get so passionate about no, this person's the best. Yeah, right? there's so. someone that could that could have come in and taken Joey off of his throne. There's someone yeah. that could have come in that took Chad off of his throne. It didn't happen, but mm -hmm. you know it could have. And. Uh, and I'm glad that you bring that up because it makes me think about what would inlines look like if uh, people didn't chase the ice skating dream, right? Mm -hmm. And you're talking about, you know, there could have been somebody that took Chad off his throne or there could have been somebody that took Joey off his throne. And a lot of us forget about Jordan Malone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jordan Malone is in between those two eras. And uh, he was an incredible, an incredible skater, multiple uh, world champion. Yeah. And uh, he probably was the next Chad Hedrick, right? Like we forget that there was that skip between Chad and Joe and uh, we didn't get to see it because he chased ice skating, yeah. right? And, and so I wonder, you know, in your opinion, what, what does inline skating look like to you? Do you think that uh, America would still be the powerhouse that it is um, if we weren't having so many of our best athletes go and chase a different sport? Um, I would say with my own personal experiences that yes, I think the U.S. would still be on top because when I did go to Utah and I did try out ice and when I came back to inlines the next year, I just, I couldn't get back, you know, back to where I was before. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I couldn't. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel the same. My mental space was different, um, which was really weird for me because I had never dealt with that before. Mm. So I feel like if I would have given inlines another year, I feel like I would have maybe even been on the top still mm -hmm. um, because I came or I, I transferred to ice the year after um, I got my junior world title. So mm. I felt like that transition to maybe the senior division, I would have been able to do something a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I do feel like the U.S. could still be, if not on top, up there. Yeah. Competing. What What was it for you that, you know, you're talking about, okay, you just hit a junior world title. You're on trajectory to be a senior world champion. I think you love the sport from watching you. It, it very much feels like that there's a passion there for mm -hmm. you. I've When I watch you race, I can just kind of feel that love for it. You know, there's just, you know, you can tell, right? Yeah. So what was it for you? What, what was this thought process of like, all right, I, I want to hang these up and then try a very, very similar challenge. Like what drew you to that? Um, I think really, cause the gold medal that I got was my last dish ditch effort. I had so many other opportunities that just didn't work out. So I felt like once I got that, I was able to let inlines go for a little bit and try something new. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like it was a good time because I was on a high. I was going right into the ice season and it felt, it just felt right because I did what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that was to win a gold medal. That was ultimately, ultimately what I wanted to do. So I felt like, it was a really good time. Mm -hmm. 
Plus, I felt like when I was transitioning to senior, usually the first year senior is a little learning curve yeah. because senior is just a completely different category. Um, so I felt like that was a good time. And if I wanted to go back to inlines to try and get, you know, a senior world title, then I could. Mm -hmm. I still had plenty of time. So I felt like it was really just the perfect time for me. Out of, uh, you know, the main decision, like the main reasons on deciding that, is it simply just because it's an Olympic sport? Yeah. 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 And, and when you break that down, like from the aspect of like, like, cause I think about weird stuff like this all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously I'm a, I'm a promoter of a sport, right? And I really try to understand the psychology of sport, right? And so mm -hmm. I look at things like um, cycling and I always wonder to myself, like, what is it that makes the Tour de France more prestigious than the Olympics, right? And maybe people could argue that with me, but I would challenge most people that Lance Armstrong's more famous household name than any cyclist Olympian in the history of the world. Yeah. Um, so what is it about the Olympics, like more from breaking that down? Is it about money? Is it about representing your country? Is it about notoriety? Like what aspect of it is that like, I want to be an Olympian? I think cause really the Olympics outside of cycling, the Olympics is like the pinnacle of sport. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people view the Olympics as that. So I feel like just to have that title, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people think that it can bring you what notoriety you may be able to get a job over someone else because you're an Olympian or mm -hmm. I feel like that title can people perceive it as being able to bring you more things in life mm -hmm. um, and personally I I thought that having that title behind my name would be really awesome yeah um, but realistically like it is just a title and I didn't feel like after I was you know ready to go back to Florida from Utah I felt like that it, it's okay if I don't have that mm -hmm. behind my name you know hard work really is the best accolade you know yeah so, so uh, at some point there was a mind shift change in this you were on ice you're mm -hmm. obviously a, a very capable athlete to have everything that you wanted with that mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a learning curve, but I have zero doubt that if your main focus was to be an Olympian, that you would not be an Olympian and, and probably an Olympic medalist. Yeah. W why'd you stop? Like, what was, why'd you stop chasing it? There was, a, I think, a lot of things that played into that. Um, I've always been a school type of person. So in the back of my mind, I had these years kind of slipping away from my academic career. So that was a little bit challenging to deal with. Um, I can say that I felt a little bit like I was falling out of love with skating. Mm -hmm. So um, that really harbored on me because I'm like very aware of my feelings. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the moment I started feeling that, it was just like a light switch. Like, I don't, I don't think this is where I need to be. Yeah. And I need to do something to figure out why and figure out how I'm going to make it better for me because mm -hmm. I know I didn't like feeling that way I didn't like feeling like I was falling out of love with the sport that I've loved for so long yeah so I felt like the the decision came to go home for a little bit skate on my inlines because obviously what mm -hmm. that's what I'm gonna do um and go back maybe in a year take a gap year you know yeah. um then I just never <laughs> went back yeah. And I felt like ultimately I was happier not being there. Do you, do you look at the two sports any differently? Like I you know, for people that are kind of involved in both worlds, we say skating, right? Yeah. Like just even now you reference to an experience you had in Utah which is ice skating. Mhm. Mm and said that you were falling out of the sport that you love. Do you view the two the same? Like, is ice skating and inline skating the same for you? Like, is it just skating or are they like two totally different things? Like, um, I would say I view the sports the same when it comes to your training, your training to go compete, your training to go win. Um, I would view that aspect of the sport differently, but when it comes to really enjoying the sport i don't feel like for me this is totally my opinion yeah. i don't feel like 
I speed skating would be something I can enjoy recreationally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like inline speed skating, yes, I still do it. Yeah. Recreationally, you know? So I feel like uh, that I, I don't know if you do it recreationally, <laughs> but like in your opinion, yes. Yeah, recreationally. yeah, for fun. I do it for fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think your fun still equals uh, one of the the best in the world. <laughs> but but yeah, we'll call it recreational uh, for now, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I think that I think a lot of that has to do with just the idea of accessibility, mm -hmm. right? Because um, right now tomorrow if it's sunny i don't know if it will be but tomorrow if it's sunny we could go put inline skates on and we could just go skate right yeah. but we don't have that same access with ice skates and like when i ice skated there's just so much preparation to go skate yeah like you're putting on layers of clothing i got to put my dang knee pads on and shin guards mm -hmm. and then you get to practice you get to pull all the dang pads out <laughs> sharpening <laughs> blades is a pain in the ass walk into the damn bathroom when yeah. you gotta pee like <laughs> like god this is a lot of work now it is i mean ice skating is fun yeah um I don't know if ice skating's fun when you can't do it at home and you have to completely change your environment to ice skate, mm -hmm. but uh, the activity itself is is a blast. Yeah, I, don't get me wrong. I had fun when I was on my skates and on the ice. You yeah, know, it's fun. I like skating, so yeah. I, it's gonna be fun. What I've always struggled with is this idea um, of trying to wrap my brain around why people view being an ice skating Olympian as more prestigious than being an inline world champion because mm -hmm. I've I've seen videos and I've even been to competitions in Colombia where I can't even comprehend how many people are watching this sport. And I went to the Vancouver Games, mm -hmm. the Olympic Games, and they didn't sell it out. So I'm like in a short track arena and the bulk of the people there weren't hardcore speed skating fans. I actually remember an experience I had where um, JR was racing and I think it was Charles Hamlin I can't remember it was one of the, the Canadians, Canadians and yeah. uh, uh, it was a B final and he got first place in the B final and they were going nuts and I remember looking at our lady and I was like you know he just got sixth place right <laughs> and she's like what are you talking about I'm like whoa this person has no clue whatsoever like that's not the top five guys like yeah that person was the fastest of the group that didn't make it and i remember thinking to myself like these aren't fans that are going to follow you after this experience these aren't fans that are true to the sport these mm -hmm. aren't fans that live it and breathe it right and then when i went to columbia like these guys are looking at this like soccer like if you took out a colombian and you were in columbia like you should sneak away because i would be a little bit worried about my safety like this isn't to play like you know what i mean and so yeah. i and I, I so i kind of sit and i think about that and i'm just like I don't know. I just don't feel like uh, being an Olympian uh, as an ice skater is more prestigious. Now, if you want to mm -hmm. argue with me about track, all right, like there's not a single soul who doesn't know who Usain Bolt is, right? Yeah. But like I could probably start naming ice skating gold medalists and the average person maybe remembers them for six months, right? And, mm -hmm. and then that audience is smaller. But like joey and chad will forever be stamped inline skating community forever yeah right and people still love those guys all from their inline roots but i don't know if they get the love from their ice roots so i, I don't know it's just something that I, I sit there and think about a lot so yeah i think once the joeys and the chads kind of left inlines i felt like the popularity kind of shifted with them mm -hmm. so once we started not having as many gold medalists in the inline world it was maybe the I guess the prize to get the gold medal was kind of like, well, that's not attainable anymore because we don't see very many people getting mm -hmm. it. So maybe that was something that brought down the importance of the gold medal. And when Chad and Joey went over to ice, they were doing well on ice and yeah. they were winning gold and doing stuff like that. So I felt like it kind of, the importance followed them. Yeah. I just don't think that it's a coincidence um, when you look at these long uh, standing clubs that produced world champions, that it's a coincidence that uh, the places that are the best have the largest group of skaters, mm -hmm. like the largest group of good skaters. Like if I look at Chad Hedrick's era, you throw a rock and you actually hit a world champion, not a national champion. Like they yeah. had world champions on his team yeah. 
that went down, right? And then you look at uh, Julie's group in Michigan. Holy smokes, right? And mm-hmm. and uh, you go, and then obviously in Florida, you had Joey and Brittany, and you had these groups. And when you split these groups, and everybody's going towards one direction, whether it's ice, and now you're left with really quality skaters, but those quality skaters didn't get the opportunity to be mentored under the best. Yeah, you never get to bring them up. I really feel like in Washington. If we had access to a facility with the group of uh, indoor skaters we have, that these are a group of kids that are capable of world medals, had have uh, they had the opportunity. Like if you just took, you know, Adrian and Gabe and Ian and Julian and mm-hmm. all these good kids, and you just picked them up and moved them into like the middle of Columbia, where they have access to skate bank track every single day, access to coaching, access yeah. to that type of information. Those kids are world champions. I completely agree. It's crazy. I see it with my brother. He, he's so he's incredible. (laughs) I mean, I can't stop watching his uh, his his uh, video. video. (laughs) He was going so (laughs) fast, and his technique got like way better. Yeah, he's incredible, and it makes me so happy because you know I have my older brother Jonathan. He speed skated. Not many people know. Yeah. But you know he didn't take it to that next level. Yeah. And now I have a sibling that's doing that. But he's been to Columbia more times than I have, and I've been a good amount of times. Yeah. And he just the when when you see his mentality for from when he leaves to when he comes back, complete different. He's you know ready to get back to it, and then you see it slowly a little bit start to decline because he's ultimately by himself. Yeah. He doesn't the have very many people. The environment matters so much for people's success, right? Yeah. Like it just does, and I really wish we could get inline skating back into a financial place where you can invest into the group that could do the next thing right Mm -hmm. it's like a double-edged sword like you need gold medals to get funding and you can't get gold medals without funding so what do you do right because there are a lot of quality skaters in the united states and if if they had the opportunity for residency and true like actually mapped out plans like these are skaters that could compete right they really could yeah and you know how I know that? Like, we've taken so many world champions or, like, top international skaters, and, and they've came to skate in NSC. Mm-hmm. And you can't say these guys can't corner, right? Like, I'm watching these guys on a bank track, and they can corner, yeah. right? Like, but as soon as they have to do an aspect of the sport that they don't do every single day, like, no one's racing Brandon. Mm-hmm. Like, they're just not going to beat Brandon, right? Like, we went to Columbia, and in that group there carlos perez was in that group yeah like he can't race brandon indoors so what does this look like for us with more access to facilities and allowing these group of skaters the real opportunity like it's just it's it's unfortunate i wish that we were able to figure out a way to financially uh start paying for the athletes to train to go to worlds to do the things that we need to do so i agree I guess we're beating a dead horse on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So shifting gears here, um, you don't have to answer this because I really think that we live in an environment now with social media where saying something could be the determination from keeping a friend or not having a friend. Mm-hmm. Like you literally could be aligned with somebody with 99% of your thoughts, belief systems. You both could be kind, loving people. But you could say something that doesn't exactly fit what they think, and all of a sudden you guys are mortal enemies. And I I hate that aspect about social media, and you air that conversation out in front of everybody instead of like a one-on-one like we're having. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my hedge before I ask you that question, right? So I'm a little nervous. (laughs) You come to Washington right in the middle of one of the strangest times I've ever lived in my life. The world's shutting down. There's people that think uh, this is the scariest thing that's ever hit us. The whole world's going to die. There's people that think this is a Chinese hoax. There's people that think that we should wear masks. There's people that think we shouldn't wear masks. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have uh, very much information on any of this stuff. And so, um, you know, with your uh, experience so far with being in healthcare and then also just from your own personal observations, I'm just kind of curious, like, you know, what's your take on this whole thing? And it doesn't have to be on the virus itself. I mean, you can just kind of talk about like 
you know, what you think it's doing to society mm -hmm. or is this a reflection of what society already looked like? And now this is an amplifier. Like, like, you know, I'd love to hear just kind of what's going through your head because all of us are in a weird headspace with all of this. Yeah. So. Um, I think it's been pretty insane considering I, you know, started a new job during this time. Um, there's just so much that goes into what we're going through right now. I think that I think that society is pretty harsh at this point. Um, for me, I'm the type of person to, I don't like confrontation, I don't like arguments. You know, I'm gonna think what I'm gonna think and the next person is gonna think what they're gonna think. Um, I think our society is full of a lot of hard-headed people who don't <laughs> wanna, you know, open their eyes to maybe something different or they don't wanna let the, next, the person next to them believe what they wanna believe. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, I think the biggest issue right now is the fact that people are attacking each other when it comes to their differing opinions, when really at this time we all need to kind of come together and try to get over this as a team. Yeah. There, it really irritates me because like you have people who are best friends that maybe one person thinks they should wear a mask one person <laughs> thinks they shouldn't wear a mask and, and now they hate, they each, hate each other <laughs> like you said and it's like it's absolutely ridiculous like do what you want to do but also remember that i'm going through the same thing that you're going through and i could also be going through something a little bit worse my situation could be like i lost my job maybe you didn't lose your job but mm -hmm. now you're coming at me because you think that I should wear a mask, you know? Yeah. I think that we need to come together and I'm not talking, you know, kumbaya, yeah. but we need to have a little respect for each other because you don't know what the next person's going through. Yeah, and that's where I uh, struggle a little bit because I really enjoy having arguments, but not arguments for the purpose of creating conflict, arguments for the purpose of furthering the discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's my favorite thing really to do. Like I, I, I love challenging ideas and I love people challenging my ideas because mm -hmm. I think that that's how the conversation really moves forward. But we live in an environment now where we can't have these long dialogues and conversation and social media to me is just not the place to have no. long Facebook dialogue. Is, yeah. It's, Facebook's it's not terrible. The place. Right. And, and, uh, it's absolutely insane to me. Like I, I'm, you know, scrolling on Facebook and I'm seeing family members fighting on Facebook. I'm yeah. seeing people lose business from their opinions on Facebook. I'm seeing the craziest things happen. And I really think that most people aren't as far away from each other's thoughts as they think they are. Mm -hmm. It just what ends up happening is that no one ever gets far enough into the discussion. Like, like if I gave you an example, like on a hot topic where if I said something as crazy as like, do you believe in the death penalty? I'll ask you. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, so the point here is with this, the reason why I ask that is that most people will answer it without asking another question. Mm -hmm. Right. And so is that, do you believe in the death penalty? Well, no. Well, do you believe in the death penalty when this circumstance happened? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you believe in the death penalty when this circumstance happens? No. But what happens is we never, ever get into the meat and potatoes mm -hmm. of the conversation. And most of us are pretty close in line with a lot of these topics. It's like that one little thing that kind of tips us one direction or the other. Yeah. But we don't get to have those conversations, which is just so unfortunate. It's just yeah. bizarre, right? But I think people don't know how to have... People don't know how to take constructive criticism. People don't know how to have a respectable conversation. They yeah. People try to hit you where it hurts, especially if they're mad. And I think that that's unacceptable, especially now when there's yeah. so much, there's so many more important things going on in life. And I just, yeah, that the, really irks me. The consequences me. are different too, right? Like I'm trying to think when social media really came out for us. I think that was after high school for me. I don't think we had, no, we didn't have social media when I was in high school, right? And so the, the you know, you get in an argument with one of your buddies at the lunch table for fun. And of course, when you're young, you got 
<laughs> I mean, how many of us still really are like, yeah, I really knew it all when yeah. I was that age, right? And so, but the conversation's done, mm -hmm. right? Like you can say the dumbest thing and maybe a week your buddies make fun of you for having the craziest thought process ever, but now it's stamped. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have the judgment yet to really go like, all right, I'm willing for my idea to live forever. I'm gonna get on the keyboard and I'm like, all right, this is my opinion on this. And now it's forever. Yeah. That's scary. So but, like, you know, it really shouldn't matter. I don't think that if you have a differing opinion to mine, I don't think that should matter when it comes to, you know, relationships. No, it, it shouldn't. shouldn't. But it is scary, though. Like I think about these I think about these kids who have to navigate this world. Like imagine being in junior high and, uh, you know, you're a young girl and you kissed a boy and that story now got way out of hand. And then now mm -hmm. you're getting bullied and it's a. It's just a weird thing that we didn't have to deal with. And I and I see that, like, you know, because you'll notice, like, sometimes on Facebook, like, older people don't really comprehend that this is, like, a public forum board. Mm -hmm. And so they're engaging differently than if you're like, all right, the whole world can see this at any <laughs> point. My employer can look at Anyone can look at this. Yeah. Like, I think I'm going to think, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying. So yeah. it's just a, a really uh, unique world. So, um well, let's uh, let's jump uh, back into into skating and and uh, I would love to hear your first uh, skating experience, like not racing, not just like like kind of when you started discovering like, hey, this is really fun. This is something mm -hmm. I think I want to do more of. Um, so my brothers, they would always go to session. Um, I was a little too young, so I just kind of sat with my mom, um, but they they went to session and the um, rink that we started at, um, they had a speed class. And again, I was too young, so I just kind of sat around and watched my brothers do it. Um, but I got to see how much they enjoyed it. So I begged my mom, well, <laughs> as soon as I'm old enough, I'm gonna do it. Um, so that was just kind of like when I first started and we did the speed class and I loved it, of course. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of went from there. Now in lines obviously mm -hmm. okay so that's that it's funny right because i think my group is the last group that split like most most my group started on quads but for a very short amount of time and then yeah. this these really cool inline things came out that were like insanely fast but no one could skate on <laughs> and they were super dangerous um first race what year is this 2006 okay and at the time uh, did Junior Olympic exist or what was the name of the beginner division for you guys? I think it was just like J.O. It still was J.O.? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Junior Olympic at I that time. I think it switched to novice like soon okay. after. And, and how old are you in 2006? Uh, eight, nine. Okay. Eight or nine. And f I'm assuming first race is like a, uh, like a local, local meet? In well, so I started near regionals time okay i don't remember skating that regionals i might have mm. but it was for a four lady okay and actually my one of my very first races was at, was at nationals one of your very first races yes at nationals? because they <laughs> needed the fourth girl and i just <laughs> popped out of thin air and there i was so it was at nationals as a four girl a juvenile uh, four girl it walked me through that right like because most people don't do their first race on one of the biggest stages so like did you even know that it was a big deal or you're just like, this is fun or like, what yeah, were you? I was, I was fast and they were like, they just kind of told me, Hey, we need you. And I was like, okay. Did you get fast pretty quick? Like, did you learn fast? Um, yeah, I learned really fast. I think at that point, I wouldn't say I was really fast. Let me back <laughs> up. <laughs> but I was fast enough for the other three girls on my team who were really fast to, you know, use me to win the relay yeah so um i learned really fast i would say my progression was a little bit slower than a lot of kids yeah um i didn't really do anything up until what my first year of freshman okay because i had to race all the girls from washington <laughs> so <laughs> um but yeah it was it took a little bit of time for me to really get fast and start you know winning races and yeah all that that's that's awesome. My first experience was on quads and I was J.O. And I remember 
rolling up to the line. I think I got to be like six or seven, maybe seven. I don't know. I roll up to the line. I fall straight on my butt. Like I can barely <laughs> stand up. And I remember I'm like holding like a kid's shoulder because I'm mm-hmm. so young and I'm like trying not to fall down. <laughs> and, uh, and But I mean, I was decent at skating. I just, you know, was so young. And so uh, I can't remember, but the gun goes off and I get smoked. And uh, after everything was done, uh, I, I mean, I don't place, right? Like I mm-hmm. get killed. And uh, after I end up with a third place ribbon, well, they screwed up and two of the kids that beat me were too old. Oh. <laughs> so I placed at my first meet. <laughs> I didn't, but I did, yeah, you know? that's awesome. Um, and then maybe a year later, um, inlines was introduced, but not really yet. Like, I don't know if you know this or not, but there was a time period where when inlines was first introduced, where you mm-hmm. actually raced quads and inlines against each other so people could choose. Oh. Like you could go, well, I think these inline things are gonna work and you could race people on quads. Mm-hmm. My dad, uh, ha- you know, my dad was smart enough to know that inlines were gonna be faster. And so he stuck me and my brother on them uh, pretty early on. And, and yeah. that's when things clicked for me. It didn't, I was okay on quads. I was, you know, like good at a regional level and a national level, like, terrible Mm -hmm. but uh the very first year inlines came out it was a race to see who could actually learn the fastest and i i won my first nationals the first year inlines came out because it everybody was technically jo like you didn't race junior olympic but you you were because it's the first year it existed so that was fun that's cool (laughs) little history lesson uh my first boot were bonds and they came folded in so you couldn't put them on until you baked them Oh so you'd put them in the oven and then they would open up. So they came like the ankles were completely crushed in. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, Bont Hustlers. I thought that was so cool. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So um, your favorite skating uh, experience. Not your best accomplishment, mm-hmm. but just your favorite skating appearance. Something that when you think about just kind of makes you smile and like, this is why I love this. Oh, wow. I always say, like, you know, my world medals. It's yeah, everybody great. does. <laughs> uh, but I really, I don't know. I would say, I would have to say that that race at NSC, the grand champion race, that was an experience that I probably would never get again. Racing, again, those people and, you know, being close to winning and the age you were and the age i was i think that is one of my favorite experiences ever is it weird for you to think that you still maybe look at those people that way but now everyone that's younger than you looks at you the way that you looked at them yeah it's it's so weird to me like i it it makes me crazy that people are like nervous to talk to me because <laughs> I would consider myself a very nice person, a person that's very approachable, mm-hmm. but it's crazy to me that there are people out there who are still afraid and intimidated by <laughs> me. <laughs> so um, let's shift here one more time. Um, I'm assuming you and Brandon are pretty serious or you wouldn't have chased him to Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, what's the, what's the future hold for you guys or do you guys want a family? Obviously you want to get married before that's something that comes up, but like, are you somebody who wants kids or? Yeah, I do want kids. I want a good amount of kids. (laughs) I grew up in a big family. How many? I told him that my minimum amount of kids is three. Minimum? (laughs) Minimum. And my maximum is like five. Okay. But I grew up, I grew up with two brothers. I was the third child. So I felt like I would be completely different if I only grew up with one or the other. I feel like I'm a good mix of both of them. Mm -hmm. So that's my logic. (laughs) Yeah. How did your family navigate with the demand of skating at the level that you guys did? I mean, you got a bunch of siblings. Mm-hmm. They all skate, right? That made it easier. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's expensive. Like, your mom must have really wore the cape. Yeah. she's She worked really hard for us. Um, she was... My um, 
biological dad. He wasn't in the picture for a long time. Um, but luckily, my stepdad, Mike, he came in early on, probably mm. when I was three. Yeah. So, you know, my mom was on her own for a little bit, but we're extremely lucky that he was able to come into the picture and really help out and really support us in what we wanted to do. Mm. Um, but I think that we all enjoyed it so much that it's kind of, they kind of thought, you know, well, we're keeping my kid, our kids in skating out of trouble. Yeah. So we're going to do whatever we can to keep them in it. That's the real value. Mm -hmm. That is really the, the value. I, I wasn't the, uh, best kid growing up amazing parents not mm -hmm. nothing that my parents did that would make me make some of the decisions that I did um and skating kept me out of a lot of those bad decisions and the times that maybe I made some bad decisions that I shouldn't have I should have been at skating practice like <laughs> I really should have been right and so I yeah. think you know that's something for any sport like that's the real investment like uh, you know especially for boys you got to keep them Busy. occupied oh my <laughs> gosh right like yeah. i don't know my daughter's crazy too so yeah vera's a little nutcase and henny's a nut so we'll see i'm gonna have my hands full <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure um well let's end it with uh something that you know i think could be really useful for um a lot of future skaters um you know let's maybe kind of aim at that you know eight nine year old level where mm -hmm. you're really starting to get passionate about this and you know, maybe you got a dream to be a world champion or an NSC grand champion or, or something of that sort. You know, what are some good tips and advice that you could give for these kids um, to stay on path, to go into the right direction, to accomplish some of their goals? Um, I'd say, you know, a lot of people set their goals really young um, and they're going to change. They're going to change no matter if it's you say you want to become a national champion well you're you're gonna do it and you gotta you know keep going um but I think I've always said this and I always I apply it to every part of my life um just don't give up mm -hmm. just keep going even if it's you feel like it's the worst day of your life you can't skate you can't even cross mm -hmm. you can't stay on your feet like just keep going because you have you have to work hard there's no question about it. Everyone who's gotten to where you want to be, um, they've worked hard. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is what I would tell myself during a hard drill or a hard day or a hard week. I mm -hmm. would tell myself just keep going because if you don't, then you're going to regret it. So keep going, keep working hard until you can't work hard anymore, you know. How do you deal with, you know, those really disappointing and challenging times you know like I, I think we always focus when we talk to these athletes like about their accomplishments and mm -hmm. you know I've seen a lot of these um, interviews and it's just a rattle off list of accolades but like you know has there been a time in skating where you know you were prepared you were you were mentally ready you were physically ready and you just flat out lost and mm -hmm you know tell us about that time and how did you deal with it like what what's the next step after that there's a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of times things didn't go my way especially especially at worlds <laughs> there were a lot of times where it should have gone my way and it didn't um this is a weird thing this is a weird way that i got over it but i just kind of tried to not be so heavy not have such a heavy heart um i would just tell myself like you know I know this sucks, but <laughs> this sounds so bad, <laughs> but I would tell myself like, there are other things that other people are going through that probably suck worse. worse yeah. You know, I would, this is really funny, but I would tell myself like, if I'm racing somebody that I know like, doesn't have the same, maybe endurance or mm -hmm. the same, just, I don't know. I would just say, you know, well, this probably sucks worse for them than yeah. it does for me. And that would just kind of like, pep me up give me a little laugh and I would just like I said I would keep going yeah one thing that always helped me because I always put so much dang pressure on myself racing and it's hard to deal with that disappointment and you mm -hmm. got to remember like in most competitions you got a bunch more races left right and yeah. it's terrible when you lose the dang first race Right, like you're like, I got this long week ahead of yeah, me. Yeah, it's <laughs> I was not expecting to get smacked the first race. Mm -hmm. And I can either turn this around or I can have a miserable week. And I think the thing that always helped me the most was um, really putting things in perspective. I remember being at nationals and it was 
um, one of the years I really was expecting to do better in pro in uh, the 1500. 1500 was always my race. I'm mm -hmm. a good middle distance racer. I made the final and I just got whooped. I made a bunch of bad decisions and I remember uh, <laughs> me and Jeremy Anderson always ate a bunch of Taco Bell. So like that was like <laughs> our recovery food. I, whatever, not part of the story, but I remember sitting there and I'm just pissed at myself and I'm, you know, eating food and I'm just kind of thinking about everything. And I just, a light bulb went off for me, which is that I'm so damn lucky, right? Like I'm so damn lucky. Like, you know how many people in the world get to go and fly around the country, even mm -hmm. the world for something that they love to do. And even though I got my ass kicked in the first race, like I'm getting an experience that other people don't get to. Yeah. And I remember having that shift and the next race going completely different for me because it wasn't about the pressure. It wasn't about like, I have to win. It's like, yeah. I get to, I get to, like I get mm -hmm. to do this. Like and some people don't get to There's always do gonna be pressure. Like. <clears throat> you can't just you know you kind of have to just push it away yeah because there's always going to be pressure no matter what you're doing you just kind of yeah. have to push it away and yeah change your perspective that's awesome well hey thanks for taking the time and and uh, i know you guys are really busy but uh no welcome problem. to washington thanks and uh, i promise you all the days won't be uh cloudy <laughs> Those, and gloomy yeah. but these are beautiful days too so yeah awesome like thank you no problem